Welcome to the Social Mission Revolution. Each week we explore some of the greatest undertold stories of businesses and everyday people who are making their ultimate impact in the world through social mission. This is Social Mission Revolution and this is your host, Andrea Putting. On the Social Mission Revolution today, I have Justin Pargotto, and I'm excited to have a chat with Justin about so many things because he's so passionate about social mission and social enterprise. So welcome, Justin. Thank you, Andrea. I am so glad to be here, and we've already been chatting for a long time before this, so uh, we've got lots to talk about. We do have a lot to talk about. But let's start with a question that I ask everybody. On, if there was just one thing for you to fight for, what would that be? Yeah, that is a big question, isn't it? It That's is the million, the million dollar question. But for me, it's to for people to know that they are unconditionally loved. You know, I talk to families all around Australia, broken families, and there's a common problem that their heart is hurt from either unmet needs, unhealed hurts, or unresolved issues, um, and so knowing that you're unconditionally loved means that you're free to give and receive love. And so everything I want to do is about helping people to both give and receive love. And for me, I guess it comes down to my faith. You know, I learnt about unconditional love from God, that when you know that you're, all of us are broken in some way, shape or form, but when you know you're unconditionally loved by God, then that can actually give you a platform to then love yourself you know, for many years, it took me a long, I was my harshest critic. Uh, yeah, we always <laughs> I think a lot of us are. And, but, you know, when you really know and have that experience that you're loved unconditionally by God, so I'm a follower of Jesus. So, you know, I've been blown away by that unconditional love that I've received. And then, you know, it's my privilege to help give that love away to others. And so what I do is all around that as a basic foundation. Yes, and I've spoken to a few people who who have come up with that kind of response that just about every problem in the world, it comes down to to love. If we love each other, then all this other stuff is not going to exist. We're just always going to act from this place of love and that will... That yeah, well, pain, pain, pain in the heart will result in either fear and we know what leads from fear you know lots of problems Uh, and we know what also comes from pride which is the other one the other manifestation of pain in the heart and so aggression and bullying and competitive nature and wanting to destroy other people it comes from brokenness so i 100 percent agree with you yes heal the heart and we have a healthy society Yes, I believe very much so, which is very much about everything that I do too. So we're here to talk about social missions. So Mm. I'd love you to share with us some of your social mission uh, journey. Journey, yes. Mm. Well, so I was thinking about this. So, you know, I'm in my 40s now. But, you know, even when I was younger, so I remember when I was about 18 or 19 and I lived in Sydney for 25 years, I was a country boy originally, grew up in Lismore, but went to the big smoke at 18 to study at the University of New South Wales. And while I was there, one of the things I did, which I found really rewarding, was to go out on a food van on a Friday night. So we'd start at Bondi Skateboard Park and we'd feed the kids and talk to the kids and encourage them. Then we would go down to Central, and there were a lot of homeless people who lived around Central at that stage, and we'd give out food. And uh, This is before Oz Harvest, so, you know, we we, we, would go to Westfield shopping centres and the store owners would give us all their leftover food, so muffins and spaghetti, and so all the stuff we had was pretty good. Um, And then also went to... Darlinghurst in the wall in 
in Sydney. And back in these days, in the 90s, it was very rough, not like it is now. So there was a mm -hmm. lot of drugs there, a lot of heroin. The male and the female prostitutes hung out there, but we just went and loved them. And I used to come home at three or four in the morning. So I found that very rewarding. Um, and it's one thing that I'll share, which I think is the key. Um, and I've thought about this a lot. You know, Australians, for whatever reason, we seem to be each year being more and more focused on consuming ourselves and what we have and less and less and less on giving back. Whereas there's no greater joy than you can get from giving to someone who can't repay you. All right? So I'll say that again because... Uh, for your listeners, you know, there's no greater joy that comes from serving people who can't repay you. So I notice that when I go to the Philippines, um, you know, we're in the middle of COVID, so last time was February this year, but um, assuming we can go overseas, I notice in the Philippines, everyone's so happy, yet they don't have much, but they're warm and they'll give you everything. And then when I come back in Australia, I notice this, this difference that we have so much more uh, consumer-wise, but we don't seem to be very happy as a whole as a society with mental yeah. health issues and, and just ungratefulness, you know, if I can be so bold as to say, you know, maybe we bought into this lie that we always need something else, more and more and more consumer things, whereas being thankful for what we do have. Anyway, so back to my journey around social um, entrepreneurship. So I then went and had kids and, you know, for that period of time, my kids were my mission. Yeah. You know, to be honest, you know, we had three kids under five and um, two of two, the boys didn't sleep, so therefore I didn't sleep. So I remember walking around like a fog for seven years. Yeah, I remember that. Without a brain. And, and one of my friends who was a bit older, she said, oh, Justin, you'll get your brain back after 10 years. And I laughed at the time, <laughs> right? But it is actually true. I don't know when it happened, but I just that one day laughed and said, wow, I can actually think again, <laughs> right? So I want to encourage everyone, like our families are our mission. And it can be a little bit of a trap, especially for people who do have a big social mission to neglect your family. But what does it profit, you know, you to gain the world but to lose your family? So just hold those things in tension. Yeah. And we are we gonna ask a question then? <laughs> no, well, so where has this all where has this led you into a social mission now? So though I, I was a part-time dad from two thousand and five to about two thousand and thirteen. So I decided that in that period of time I would work part time, so did my wife. And so for one or two days a week I looked after the kids and went places, parks and hung out with um, a lot of women. There weren't too many men doing that. No. <laughs> but it was it was fun and joyful and I wouldn't swap that time for the world. But when I got my brain back, you know, uh, 2013, I happened to get invited to uh, go on a social entrepreneurship mission to South Africa with an Aussie social entrepreneur called Creel Price. And Creel is this incredible entrepreneur who just starts businesses, you know, left, right and centre. Yeah. But one of the things he was doing was he was part, he wrote a section of the syllabus for the Richard Branson School of Social Entrepreneurship right in the heart of Joburg. So every year he would take 12 Aussies over and I was one of those, but then he'd take 12 of the Branson Centre graduates and we went up to a game park up in, I don't know, an hour north of Johannesburg and this is in a game park where there's nothing that can eat you. Right, so there wasn't. <laughs> so you were safe. <laughs> yeah, so there wasn't lions, and you know the big four weren't there, but still beautiful. You know, so yeah, all the spring box and the um, other just beautiful creatures. So we did a a, a boot camp on entrepreneurship, uh, particularly with a social um, a social bet. And while I was there, this it was like this thing that was already in me just got fueled. Yeah, and I had this idea. Um, that came there, which when I came back to Australia uh, to start an ethical procurement uh, company, which actually matches 
um, companies with ethical supplies. So that was the start of my journey. And I did that for a few years because I was really passionate, number one, about ethical procurement. Number two, I was really passionate about ending human trafficking. And so I did a lot of research into um, bonded labour and the huge problem that that is in the world and the fact that as companies, as the West, we are buying things which are made in sweatshops, made in uh, places where the kids and the families are sometimes in multi-generational slavery, right? And that's that. Yeah. I couldn't accept that. Right. So that was that was part of my why for that business um, and connecting people. And then, you know, probably my next journey started in 2016. And I guess I want to encourage our listeners, sometimes things just find us. You know, we're not always yeah. looking for it. Yeah. But to be aware of what's going on and to listen to your heart behind, you know, listen to what's going on in your heart. Um, as I look at that beautiful tapestry behind you. <laughs> um, and, you know, we can get so caught up in the day-to-day lives and actually thinking about, you know, what we've got to do consuming, you know, as opposed yeah. to just taking a step back and say, okay, what what is around me? What can I do? So anyway, back to the story. So my friend who I've known for 25 years, Mario Potastatis, he's a Filipino guy. He's in his 60s. Um, when I lived in Sydney, um, we went to the same church together, but really good friends. And he stood up one day and he said, we're going on taking a team to do a leadership conference in the middle of nowhere in the Philippines. Who wants to come? Yeah. And, you know, at this time I was busy running my businesses, busy with three kids. <laughs> so I had, sure. I had plenty to do, <laughs> right? And I also love Asia. So in Sydney I hung around with a lot of Asian people. I don't know why. I always was a, you know, resonated with Asian people, but not Filipinos, funnily yeah. enough, right, even though my wife had been. Anyway, so when Mario stood up, this, my heart burned. That's the only way I can describe it. My heart just started, you know, pumping. Yeah. Yep. And there was also an opportunity to go to Africa to work in this other very cool project. Like, it's a very cool project, but I was like, you know, my heart was unmoved by that one. So, yeah. again, I guess encourage, you know. It, yeah, it's about listen, that something will, something will call you when you least expect it, it's just being having all of your pieces in it so that you, you're ready to recognise it. And to recognise that it's risky. You know, I've got yeah. a lot more comfortable with risk over the years. Like not everything I've done's worked. But, you know, I love that saying from Theodore Roosevelt, you know, the battle belongs to the person in the arena, the person <laughs> who gets in the arena and there's blood and there's... You know, yeah. I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, well, gee, I'd wonder whether I'd had a go at that. What? How would it have turned out? Mm-hmm. I'd much rather champion things and go for things. And, you know, what is success anyway, really, at the end of the day? that's I talk a lot to families about real prosperity. And, you know, in the um, Hebrew language, prosperity is actually peace wholeness and well-being in every area of life wow right so peace wholeness and well-being in every area of life so i read that yeah. about 15 or 20 years ago and this light you know that was a light of picture, doesn't it? it's like yes that's what prosperity really is if you leave out those other areas then it's meaningless it's it is meaningless and that's and i could get we we could talk about this for a long time i don't know whether you want to but it's something that I feel very passionate about that I believe we've, we've been seduced by a lie in Australia that prosperity is primarily financial. Yeah. To the neglect of all the other stuff. And it's killing Australia. It is killing. Okay, in the mean, meaningless, in mental illness challenges. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying all mental illness challenges come from lack of purpose, but I'm just saying part of it does. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, and so we've got to go after that. So anyway, so Mario stood up and said, who wants to come? My heart burns. I go home to my wife and I say, 
I don't know why, but I've just got to go on this trip. Will you let me? And she said, yeah, 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 go. Anyway, <laughs> um, so she's very good, my wife, and I think she knows me well enough by now that she knows I won't be happy if I live a normal, boring, mundane life. I have to do these things yep. which um, are about changing the world, you know, even in little ways. You know, that's the other thing as well. We we think, you know, to change the world we have to do these things where 4.4 billion people know what we've done. <laughs> we, they, yeah, don't. they don't. <laughs> you know? I, that's why I always say you've just, just changed one person's life and you've changed the world. Correct. So anyway, I went once, right, and we went to, uh, we spent a bit of time in Manila, not much, but then we went to these two middle-of-nowhere places. Yeah. Right? And... I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the people. And then Mario and I said, you know, how? what can we actually do to actually continue this transformation process? And part of it, and this is what I've also got a lot of passion about as well, I think charity, and this is a big call, is ruining the world, right? So I'll explain what I mean by that because it might does sound I, a bit offensive. I understand what you're right. saying, but, but it'd be good to explore it. Yeah, so I'll explain it so people don't want to stone me over the... <laughs> over the yeah, okay. <laughs> this is a position I've come to after thinking about it a lot for the last probably 10 years. Charity works when there's, a, there's an immediate need. So it might be a national disaster, mm -hmm. you know, you know, COVID or an earthquake or a tsunami or something like that where there's people who are just in desperate need. Like at the moment, there's 40 million people in the Philippines who are hungry. So all the social enterprise stuff is going out the window. Their main focus is just to keep people yeah. fed one, one yeah. meal a day, right? So Survival mode. So I'm not saying get rid of that, right? So please, listeners, yeah. don't. Hear me say that. What I am saying is, though, is that when charity becomes an, an entitlement where a handout is what you expect and it actually, Mario has a great expression for it. He calls it clipping people's wings so they can't mm. fly, right? So in the Philippines, what we determined is we wouldn't be a, a group that would just be a charity. And the other thing is charity is always required to be fed. There's That's never right. enough money because you're always just giving out. Yeah. Right? Whereas I much prefer social enterprise, right? Okay. And I talked about this at Sydney Uni to their master's students last year. And the title of my talk was Charity is Dead, Long Live the Hybrid, right? And the core message of that, that talk to the, the master's students was I believe business is going to, is changing. What is happening is that business needs to incorporate more of a mission so that everything they do has purpose. Yeah. So they can still be profitable, but they uh, deliver social good to society in the areas that's relevant to them, aligns with their goals and values. Yeah. Charities need to move along the scale, so they're both at different ends at the moment. They both need yeah. to move this yeah. way. Charities need to work out what valuable services can they provide to the community that is sustainable and profitable but profit with purpose. Yeah. Okay, because charities have this amazing group of supporters who love them and they could go down the track of building partnerships and generating income that's done with integrity, right, um, so that they're not always reliant on giving money, on receiving money. So anyway, so in the Philippines, that's what we decided to do. So we tried a, a little business over there, but we worked out it was never going to be, you could never scale it. And then we thought, what do people love to do? Well, they love to travel, don't they? Mm -hmm. And then what are we about? bringing purpose-driven experiences. So put those two together, holidays with purpose. That yep. was our light bulb, right? Brilliant. So that's what that, and it is a social enterprise. 
It's profit with purpose, and we are a B Corp, which means it's a global accreditation, which means that um, we have been recognised as one of the few in the world who are actually um, running their business for good and meeting a very high level of standard. Um, so anyway, so we were well on our way to providing these holidays with purpose and we had different trips like parents and kids um, can take their go away on a volunteering holiday together. So I'll share it this way. I think the difference between a pure for-profit company and a social enterprise is this. A profit company says, how can we make money first and foremost shareholder returns and then it might add a little bit of doing good on the side? Yep. A social enterprise says, what is a social problem that we want to solve and then we'll try and make it a, bit, a profitable uh, business out of it? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. If they're asking very different questions. So for the Philippines, our, thing, our question we asked was, how can we actually be part of transforming part of the Philippines, right, but also transforming the people who come and make it sustainable so we're not just ploughing money in? Otherwise, we may as well just give the money away. Yeah. So with the parents and teenage kids, we call it build a lifelong bond with your kids. And the problem that I wanted to solve there was, you know, do you know that uh, in general, parents only spend about seven minutes a day talking to their teenage kids. Wow. Right? So it's as little as that. So how are the relationships going to be strengthened? They're, they're not. And contrast that with teenagers are spending up to five hours a day online. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's very different now than it was, you know, even yeah. when you and I grew up. Or when my, when my children were growing up. You know, there was the no internet, online. <laughs> the internet didn't exist till I'd even finished university, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, my children still, re they remember seeing the internet for the first time. They're kind of in that age group. So the difference, they didn't have that continuous stream of internet. Right. So you've got kids spending four to five hours on social media, but seven minutes talking to their parents. You also have both parents working in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, you know, pay off massive mortgages, some of them, um, and coming home late. So yes. I thought to myself, how do we actually turn the hearts of the parents and mother and dad to the kids and the kids to the parents? How do we solve that problem? Yeah. So that was what was up here. And then bingo, all right. When I did a fathering course, one of the things they told me is you make your kids feel special by taking them on a one-on-one -on -one holiday. Absolutely. Right? And then after I went to the Philippines, I said, we've just done this amazing charity work over here. And then the light bulb was, why don't we actually combine the two? And then see what I mean? So I want to encourage people, listen to what your heart's saying, listen to what you're passionate about, but also listen to what your past experiences Mm -hmm. have done because I did that fathering course in 2005 but this actual idea to build a lifelong bond with your kids and to solve the problem by going on a one-on-one -on -one trip but the final piece of that didn't come in until I went to the Philippines in 2015 or 16 whenever it was yeah yes so it can be that time and that's that's why I look at it and, and say when you understand what your values are what your stories are, what your skills and strengths are, get all that in place and then you're ready to listen to where you're called to be. And that experience, that something will come up but you've got to be ready to, ready to hear it, ready to move into, into that space of, of allowing that to happen in your life. And absolutely, and, and that will look different to different people. Absolutely. So, you know, for me, I am passionate about a lot of things, but primarily families, yeah. social entrepreneurship, and, um, you know, and anything which results in transforming society. Yeah, right? so but you not pull those all together and, yeah. and you create what you have created, taking people to 
the Philippines, transforming their lives, transforming family lives. How awesome is that? You know, and the people who go are just as transformed as the people yeah. there. So the actual mission is both, it's multifaceted. Yes, we're doing some cool things like building a house or building part of a house or mm -hmm. going in the slums, you know, but when the kids go in the slums, right, so we take them right yeah. in there, right into the middle and we do a feeding program and talk to the kids. You know, the kids who go, the teenagers who go, said, maybe it doesn't matter if I don't have an iPhone 12. Maybe it's not that important. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I might be thankful about how good the transport is in Australia or how good our hospitals are or even the fact that, you know, I have a pretty big house by world standards, <laughs> you know. I have everything that I need, so it produces gratefulness. So to me, that result is just as important to me as what we do over there and also yeah. um, the joy that I see when the parents and the kids are just lit up by their relationship is. Yeah, it sounds can't, awesome. Can't put money on it. So anyway, any parents and teenage kids, we're hopefully going to go again in January 2022, but we run them every year. Um, so tripsplus.org, and I'm sure you can put that in from the notes. But, yes. you know, that's only one of the things we do. Right, so for Trips Plus. Another one of the very cool things is Mario and I said, you know, what's something that's really needed in the Philippines? Right, so Philippines is 110 million people. And about 15 to 20% of them are in real poverty. Yeah. Like significant poverty. There's others, like the Philippines, if you want to classify it, there's a small number of families at the top who own everything. You yep. know, all the beer, telecommunications, property. Like yep. the malls in the Philippines make Westfield look like corner stores. Wow. There's one with about 400 restaurants <laughs> in the one mall, <laughs> right? <laughs> the biggest one Mind in the boggling. Right? And so I've only eaten in about four of them, uh, <laughs> right? Um, but then you've got a growing middle class, but then you've got everyone else left behind by technology, lack of capital, and um, so forth. But anyway, right down the bottom, there's people who they can't afford to even go to the doctor or dentist. Yeah. You know, so 40 pesos is about $1.20 Australian. People can't even afford that, some people. So Mario and I said, why don't we mobilise people to go, doctors, dentists, nurses, um, but also everyday people, like I'm not a medical person, so I always get asked because I organise it, Yeah. what are you, Justin? And I said, I don't know anything <laughs> about medical, yeah. but I do know how to love people, right? Yeah. I do know how to put myself in someone's shoes and see what they're in it and serve them. Um, and the reality is over half of our team is non-medical people right, because you need a lot of logistics, you need to do crowd control. And so my job is picking up babies when the mum's getting weighed, weighed right, practising my Tagalog. I love to speak Tagalog over there, but because I haven't been in eight months, it's, it's leaving my brain. But um, And then giving joy and then helping them through the process. And, you know, we, in four days, we gave 968 free medical and dental appointments, right? Yeah. And in January 2022, if what we're planning to comes ahead, we're going to go for about double that in terms of the clinic time. So we might be closer to 2,000 people. And the other thing is as well, a lot of these people don't even have medical records. So we're the first no. people to give them medical records and then yeah. we don't we don't come in as white knights which again goes back to the charity yeah. problem a yeah. big problem is america in in the philippines is they've been given so much money as a handout then they have this handout mentality so we didn't want to go in with that so we actually work in with the local mayor the local health department and we get their permission and we get their workers to come and help us and then 
we create medical records and pass them on so they can be followed up. Yeah. So, yeah, you really need that participation from the community of what do they need and how can we help them to fulfil their own needs? Correct. So you're asking very different questions. So you yeah. question, what do you need? How can we help? As opposed to, we want to bring this in. Yeah. Which is yeah. a colonial, you know, type thinking. Yeah. So it's it's empowering them to also step into that place in the future, which is really yeah. important. As and well. upskilling the um, the local health people. So in yeah. Ilo, Ilo, which is a place where hopefully we're going to go, a lot of the people who are going to come this time have a real passion around um, maternity nursing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're going to do is educate the local people, the local okay. uh, nurses, so they can get upskilled. So you're literally leaving this deposit that is going to keep going. And back to what I was saying before, there's incredible joy that you get from giving to people who can't repay you. So I was there February 1st to February 15 this year and COVID was just starting to break out and yeah. you know, people were wearing masks. But, man, I had a good time and I came back on cloud nine. Like I'm still I'm thinking about it now. And, you know, it's not like you know, social enterprise should be fun and enjoyable. So we go over and we do this stuff and we work hard, but we also have a lot of fun. So the place we stayed overlooked the mountains and had an infinity pool. So we'd work hard from leave at seven and get home at five. But on the way home, we'd stop for a coconut, you know, or a coconut pie. And then we'd get home and get back to the hotel and get in this infinity pool that overlooks the mountains and have a few beers, you know, and then eat very well and go to waterfalls, you know, stunning waterfalls, go to this place where you the clouds are in the mountains. So, you know, we design yeah. these life-changing experiences that are just incredible. So I go just as much for what I get out of it as well. Yeah. So that brings up a, a point that some people would think, well, it's my holiday. I'm tired. I work hard. I don't want to go and volunteer because that's just going to drain me more. And actually it doesn't. It, it reinvigorates people, doesn't it? Absolutely. So, so they, they become you know, more excited about life and gives them and that they can bring that passion, that excitement back into their every day because then they find the purpose in working is to give them the opportunity to, to do more of these great things in, in the world. Yeah, and, you know, the... <laughs> there's this funny expression they're called drop and flop holidays right yeah, yeah. you just go drop and flop and yeah again, no. it's all about you but you know all the statistics are saying people are not finding those types of no. holidays satisfying what no, they no. really want is to go away and live like a local so in some of the cases we stay not for the whole trip but we stay in a local person's house yeah. So this year I'm not practising my Tagalog with kids who are five and six in a, a house that is only two rooms, bottom and upstairs, and I live, I sleep in the only bed in the house. They're on the floor next to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you come and have this communal dinner where they lay it all out and the, the kids come and do a dance for you you know, and present to you, you can't put yeah. a price on that. No, you, know? you can't. Again. And again, we, we bought this lie that says that everything's all about us, but it's actually in giving that you actually, as you said, get energised yes. and you become alive. Mm -hmm. you know? yep. And when you live with passion, you live with purpose, you come alive every day has meaning. That's right. right. So that's the other thing I guess I want to encourage people of. Find meaning and purpose in everything you do, right, and then everything becomes important. So even if you're doing a menial job, so let's say cleaning the toilets or something, right, I don't know what it is, 
you know, in Australia we have these attitudes that yeah, certain things are beneath us or there's no meaning in that. But what if in whatever we're doing we could find meaning and hope and purpose in it so that we could find satisfaction rather than always looking for it? And I think the Dalai Lama talked about it, something like, in the West, people are always living in the future and living in the hope that, you know, somewhere out there, but life is meant to be lived now. Yes. In the present and giving and receiving is the key to joy and happiness. So, you know, I can't wait to go on these trips. I was supposed to be in the Philippines many times this year, you know, helping business owners run retreats, taking them into the slum, taking schools, taking, um, you know, maybe doing another medical mission, uh, taking other groups, and we'll get back there. But, you know, why not just have it that as an overseas once experience? You know, how can we find that in our local region? And this is something which I'm trying to model to our kids that, you know, in my local region, I'm giving back to our cricket club. So someone's got to run the cricket club. Yeah. And, there's not 30 hands that go up at the annual no, general meeting, so, <laughs> right? Um, pick me, pick me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, again, I get a lot of joy and satisfaction that people enjoy playing cricket and it's a form of serving, you know, scoring at your kids' cricket yeah. games or basketball games. Again, we're not bowled over by the amount of parents who come volunteering to school, but I think, well, again, it's just modelling that life is not all about receiving, it's about yes. giving. Yeah. So we're going in all, we are in a lot of directions here. We are, cool. we are, and, and unfortunately we're out of time, but you've given us so much value, so much to think about and to 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 really ponder and on our life and how we can start to make a difference in the world, which is really what Social Mission Revolution is all about. So I thoroughly enjoyed going off on these <laughs> tangents and being able to have about as close to a rant as I get. Uh, <laughs> I don't normally do angry rants, but, you know, in terms of I call them passionate yeah. you know, exhortations is probably a better word to say yeah. for people to live and to not get seduced by this lie that consuming will make us happy. It yeah. won't. Yes. Um, so be a person who lives with purpose, be people who give, be people who take risks even when, you know, it might fail. Be people who um, experience the joy of actually, um, you know, embracing social mission, embracing social enterprise. And, you know, if you work in a for-profit corporate, you know, look at what change you can bring there. There's plenty yeah. of great stuff you can do. It's not about having to change and start your own social enterprise necessarily or or go work for a charity or no. it's about knowing where you're planted and how can you use your gifts your talents and your passions in the place where you are to actually make a difference beautiful what a wonderful place to, to end the podcast thank you so much justin i really appreciate my it. pleasure i've really thoroughly enjoyed it thank you and we'll be back next time with another Social Mission Revolutionist. This has been the Social Mission Revolution with Andrea Putting. Join me again next week when we'll speak to another Social Mission Revolutionist who will inspire you on your journey to making your ultimate impact on the world.